Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of Encounter with God Together, our weekly audio and video podcast that follows along in the readings from our daily Bible reading guide by the same name, Encounter with God. And each week I welcome a guest, and this week's guest is no stranger to this community, I'm sure, Whitney Cunningham, President Emeritus of Scripture Union, who has long uh, been writing and still writes for this uh, publication. Whitney, it's great to have you here. Well, it's great to be back. I love being part of Encounter with God together. So, uh, yeah. and it's good to see you, Gail. I was just in Greece uh, at a at an international event, and I have to do some Bible nerd bragging here a little bit. But <laughs> uh, I was in Athens, and uh, one morning I had a little free time, so I walked up Mars Hill, and oh. uh, I had my little Bible with me, and I read from Acts 17 and 18 at what. Uh, we think was the spot where uh, the Apostle oh, wow. Paul gave his Mars Hill speech. So if that's not a Bible nerd uh, quiet time, I don't know what it is, but it was a wonderful trip. <laughs> that's amazing. That's really amazing. Uh, I'm so glad. And, you know, I still hear from people and maybe even some people who are watching who so much enjoyed the encounter with God weekends that you would do in Valley Forge. And uh, so it's a long history of, you know, from there to Mars Hill. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Well, we had some good times in the Word together. That's great. Well, let me pray for you as we get started or continuing on in, in Revelation. Okay. Father, I do pray for Whitney right now that you would um, you would infuse him with your spirit as he uh, shares his thoughts and your thoughts on, on um, the readings that are coming up this week. They're hard readings, God, and they're hard to understand, but I pray that you will give us uh, ears to hear and wisdom to uh, discern. And I, I just pray for Whitney in, in, in Thanksgiving right now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, yeah, we're in Revelation 15 to 18. Right. And, um, well, you know what, Gail? You gave me a hard assignment because you're you prayed about it, and I'm glad you did because I would say these chapters, 15 through 18, are – in my view, anyways, they're the most difficult to understand in all of Revelation. Revelation is a difficult book and a wonderful book. But this is probably the most difficult part because at the beginning, you know, you get the sort of the prologue and the setup. And then you get those messages to the seven churches. And those are real concrete, clear. You can relate to that. Um, and then we get some of the images of heaven and the throne and the 144,000 and lots of wonderful things like that, all nice and pretty much nice and clear. But when you get to 15 through 18, that's when it gets the most challenging because, you know, there's the bowls of God's wrath. And then there's this, this beast with seven heads and 10 horns. And then there's a woman riding on the beast. And then there's all these different things happening. So it's really hard to figure out. And um, and what I want to do uh, just as we start is maybe help our, our um, listeners today have a way to, to look at this that they may be able to take something out of it uh, for their own mm -hmm. life and their own readings. And so last time, I think, Gail, when you and I talked about Revelation, um, I, I suggested a way to look at Revelation is like a dream. Now, yes. it's not a dream, OK, it's a vision that that uh, John had. But just as a, a way for us to think about it, like when you have a dream, just in your you wake up and you don't remember every little detail, but you remember the main feeling, the main impression, the main takeaway. And that's one way uh, that's useful to, to remember. You may say, oh, I'm overwhelmed by all these details, but I but this is my main takeaway. So that's one way. But I want to suggest another way today to look, especially at these uh, really challenging bits. And um, scholars over the years, different scholars, and I, I, I won't say that I agree with every little uh, approach here, but there's four basic approaches that scholars have taken to Revelation. Um, the first is the preterist view. Now, uh, preterist is uh, from a Latin word called past. And so some scholars see everything in the book of Revelation all about the past, all about the first century. So it was only relating to the first century. A second way is the history, historist way. And um, in this way, it's like everything from the first century through the rest of times. Now, the reformers, 
um, tended to look at it this way. And what they would see in this is, you know, the evil and the and the and all of that was papal Rome. You know, so they saw it through their own history. A third way is the futurist way. And um, actually evangelicals, some evangelicals have tended to look at it this way, that it's all about the end times. That's all it's about. And I don't know if any of our uh, listeners are old enough to remember uh, the book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Did you ever hear that by Hal Lindsey? Yep, yep. Um, and you I'm not that old, but yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't remember that, Gail. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, a detail about that, that was the best-selling uh, nonfiction book of any book, according to New York Times, wow. in the 70s, in the decade of the 70s. So it was very, very popular, but it was all about the end times. And then the last way um, is poetic. Some people just say, well, this is just all apocalyptic poetry, and it just is themes about you know, good and evil and God wins in the end. So there's different ways to look at it. Now, I actually have my own way of looking at it. And my own way uh, is all of the above. So I think each one of those gives us a way to look at it and not any one of them gives us the final answer, the final approach. And so when we read Revelation, you know, it does say something about the past. It does say something about history. It does say something about the end times. And it is wonderful poetry. I mean, uh, uh, you know, some of the greatest uh, music has been inspired by this. So it's all of the above. Yeah, I like um, that. So what I want to do here is with that in mind, what mm -hmm. I want to do is suggest um, a couple of themes that are coming at us in our readings this week and uh, suggest some ways with this all of the above approach to how we can read and understand um, these challenging chapters. And um, I kind of, uh, I like, uh, it's sort of a theme of Bible interpretation, I guess. And it comes out of Psalm 119.89, Psalm 119.89 Psalm 119 is, is, you know, sort of heart language for scripture union people, but uh, verse 89 says, O oh Lord, your word is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your word is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. And I like to think of it that way, that God's word is eternal. It's inspired, but it's eternal. It transcends time. It speaks about the past. It speaks about the present. It speaks about the future. And if anything um, gives us God's eternal word. It's uh, the book of Revelation. So when we do our readings this week, what we're going to find is there are two big themes that emerge. <clears throat> the first is the seven last plagues. So there's seven plagues that are predicted and talked about, seven angels and seven plagues. And the second big theme is Babylon the Great. And so um, how can we get something out of it? Well, I would suggest that if God's word is eternal, let's ask the simple question, well, what would this have meant to the original hearers, mm. first century Christians who were under the domination of Rome and who um, Rome required them to say Caesar is Lord? And this fledgling band of Jesus followers had the audacity to say, no, Jesus is Lord and only Jesus is Lord. So mm -hmm. if you think of it through the pressures that the first century Christians were under, that will give us some insight. But also we need to ask a second question. What do we get out of it? What does it mean to us today? And so what would it have meant to the original hearers and what does it mean or what do we take away from it today? So let's think about that with the, with the seven last plagues. Um, so you, you, our, our readers would remember that earlier in the book of Revelation, there were these seven trumpets where the mm. angels announced judgment that was coming. Well, how do these seven, you know, uh, plagues relate? Well, uh, they're, an expansion or a fulfillment of what was announced with the trumpets. So the trumpet said, this judgment is coming. And if you compare the two, you, you realize it's kind of a, 
it's now it's it's rolling out. The trumpets announced it, and now the they're rolling out. So that's a way to see it. Um, but one of the things that comes in these uh, plagues is the notion of God's wrath, God's mm -hmm. wrath. And so think about, well, first of all, let's just think about God's wrath. You know, uh, some th that turns a lot of people off to the Bible, to Christian faith. And because uh, they think, well, God, that means God's mad. You know, it's like if I kind of make a little mistake, you know, lightning bolts are going to come down on me. God's wrath. He's mad at me. But actually, the notion of God's wrath is uh, about God's righteous judgment on sin and evil. And, you know, the people who say, well, I don't like God's wrath. I want to keep that out of the out of the story. You wouldn't want that. You wouldn't want there to be no judgment on sin and evil. If right. everything was just, well, you know, everybody's pretty much okay. You wouldn't want that. You want a God who loves the sinner and hates the sin. And so when we read these um, seven last plagues, these, these bowls of God's wrath, mm. how would uh, a a group of Christians that were facing the hedonism and the domination and all the things that went in the first century, how would they hear it? But my question for us is, what about our world today would cause God's wrath? Mm. What's happening today? And I don't mean people over there. I mean, what are we part of? You know, how are, how are we pulled into a system that may cause God's wrath. And mm. so that's a question we can ponder when we read these uh, challenging bits. But there's a second thing. And the second thing is we're going to read about Babylon the Great. And, uh, you know, Babylon is a kind of a familiar, uh, you know, nation and people in the Bible. If you read the Old Testament, they were the vehicle that God used, the, 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 ar the powerful army God used to take Judah into exile, you know, in 587 BC. And so it was, has a real historical context. But Revelation is the only place in the Bible where you get the phrase Babylon the Great. And scholars have debated, well, what in the world is that? What does it mean? They go back and forth and, and all of that. But in general, it means whatever system is anti-God, whatever system uh, is anti-Christ. And of course, that's a big theme in Revelation. So if we ask ourselves, how would they hear and what would what would the first century Christians think when they when they think Babylon the Great? What would be the dominating system of evil, the evil empire, if I can use a, a contemporary movie image? What was the evil empire that was anti-God, anti-Christ at the time? And we can ask ourselves the same question for today. Yeah. And maybe personalize it and say, how can we resist the anti-Christ or the anti-God system that we that that's all around us? Now, let me try to give an example here. You know, um, a lot of people talk about the uh, metaverse. Have you heard? Have you heard that uh, term, the metaverse? It's like the digital reality, the digital universe. And more and more people, especially young people, that is their reality. You know, they're yeah. they're they're drawn into, you know, just their whole identity is digital. Mm. And um, and so, I think. <laughs> And, and there's a lot of good about digital. I mean, look at what we're doing right here. There's, you know, we're 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 engaging people with God's word because of the digital uh, opportunities that we have. But at the same time, this digital world is um, it's not it's it's deconstructing truth in a way. So mm -hmm. everybody has an opinion, and a, you, this, that, and the other. So how do you contend for truth in right? That? And I've been thinking the real metaverse in our society is not the digital one. It's the salvation reality. 
And, and so the real reality that we live in is the fact that God created human beings and all things, and then sin entered the world. And then God selected a people, his chosen people, the Israelites, to begin revealing himself to. And eventually he started predicting a savior, a Christ, an anointed one who was, was to come someday. And it culminated in the birth, death, resurrection. And someday, as we read in Revelation, someday, the second coming of Jesus. That's the real metaverse whether we choose to acknowledge it or not. And so mm. my question is, how are we um, committing ourselves? How are we living in that metaverse? And what other metaverse, what other Babylon is the alternative that's all around us? Yeah. And I know that's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit of an analogy, but what I'm trying to get at is the reality that we live in as believers, actually the reality that every human being lives in, whether they acknowledge it or not, is that salvation metaverse. And in your, your Christian life, your whole life doesn't make sense until you see yourself as part of that. And revelation is the culmination of that story. Revelation is where it finally all comes together. And it ends with, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus, the culmination of what's really true and really real. So that's what's exciting. Now, there's one last thing, Gail, that I think we should do b before we end, because you said at the beginning, this is a challenging set of chapters 15 through 18 mm. but if if you read you, the they did us a little favor in the encounter with readings it takes a little bit of chapter 19 uh gives us one reading in chapter 19 and that's where we begin to get a preview of the final episode we're not gonna you know finish the book of revelation we'll do that later in the year but we get a little preview about what's to come and i wonder if i could ask you to read a little preview, and it's a very positive preview, but it's in uh, chapter 19, verses 6 and 7, because this is the preview of how the book, the Bible, the true metaverse ends and in a way begins for all eternity. So I'll let you read. Hmm. Okay, I will. 19, 6 and 7. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude like the roar of rushing waters and loud peals of thunder shouting hallelujah for our lord god almighty reigns is there more yeah and seven. Oh, and seven okay sorry sorry <laughs> for our lord god almighty reigns um sorry let me find my spot again let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. His bride has made herself ready. Amen. Amen. So, you know, there's a song ringing in my ears from that. Uh, that, But that's the that's the final, that's the preview of the final, uh, the end of the story and the beginning of eternity. And that's what's so exciting about these uh, verses that we're going to be reading this week. Yeah, thank you for that, that ending. I think it is... Um, it is a hopeful and and a make sense kind of kind of uh, conclusion there to what's what's to come. Yep. Appreciate it, Whitney. Well, it's yeah. so good to have you here and back from from Greece. And uh, I hope we'll we'll be in touch again soon. Yeah, I look forward to it. All right. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Bye for now. Bye bye.